Today we'll be dipping our photographic toes into an enticing world of ethereal portraits. We're going to see the surreal normality of apartheid South Africa before revisiting the early 90s music scene. Three very different photographers in a bit of an eclectic mix, which will just go to show you how broadly you can cast your net when looking for photography to inspire you. A little bit from here, a pinch from there, and you'll start to blend your own distinctive imagery and style. How's it, how's it? One of the best things about this channel so far, aside from the wonderful community, is that in addition to being able to share my love for photography with you, I'm also being introduced to photographers who are, well, they're new to me. It's a constant reminder. There's always someone new to discover who will capture our attention, who's going to excite us with their photography. These three photographers I'm going to share with you today have influenced my own photography in, in various ways, and I, and I certainly hope that they're going to inspire you in some small way too. I'm a big sucker for portraits that are, well, on, on the surface, fairly simple, you know, but once you spend a little time with them, discover that they're quite subtly complex. Now, I'm not sure if that's even like a real thing, you know, subtly complex, and it, and it probably isn't, but you know what, I'm just going to run with it. So I suppose what I'm driving at is that if you look at a Joyce Tennyson portrait quickly, it could feel like any sort of run-of-the-mill late 80s, early 90s kind of arty glamour portrait, especially this image of Jodie Foster. It has that odd vibe that portraiture from the period seems to have, you know, the, the, the canvas background, the, the draped clothing. Now perhaps it's something a little bit deeper, perhaps it's just the quality of something that's photographed on film. The, the, the film images seem to have an organic feel to them that, that digital doesn't quite seem to have. Yes, I'm totally aware of the, of the contradictory nature of that statement. You know, after all, I'm now talking about a, dip, a digital representation of, of an image and I'm presenting to you in a digital way. There is nothing organic about any of this. You know, it's just that there's something about a photograph that's, that's created on film that, that has this sort of feel to it. So it's somewhat akin to like when audio files describe this or discuss the differences between sort of vinyl and CD. You know, to, to, to people for whom this matters, it matters a great deal. But for, I think for most people, they'll sort of say, well, I don't see any sort of any, where's the benefit? Anyway, no, no doubt this is going to spark some other debate in the comments below, like the previous video did uh, with its Photoshop gate um, type of stuff. Anyway, that's a neat segue into something that I, I love, 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 love about Joyce Tennyson's work. And this is the way that she plays with light physically in her portraits. You know, so, so she's not doing any sort of photoshoppery sort of stuff on this. And when I first saw them, I spent ages picking apart the techniques that I, I believe she's employing in, in her lighting setups, especially the ones where there is some sort of painting with light effect going on. In all of photography, it's, the, it's this way that light can be physically manipulated that I find so fascinating. If you're not familiar with this technique, I mean, it basically means you keep the shutter open so, and everything is obviously pitch black, so there's no light around. And, and then you, you are going to use a source of light to, to register stuff on, on, this, on the center of the film manually. In this case, I'm guessing the model was posed, you know, the studio is darkened and, and then the strobes are triggered. And then a torch of some other sort of light source was then used to paint in the parts, maybe like the, the halo around the head. Now, aside from the, the semi-religious and symbolic aspects of some of Joyce Tennyson's images, which is not completely surprising given that her parents worked in a convent when she was young, what I do like is this painterly quality of the light. It's absolutely beautiful and it's very simple. And this is why we're talking about this, sort of this simple complexity. You can't just light stuff and, and make it soft. You have to have shape. The light needs to caress and it needs to mold the subject. It needs to allow the subject to speak, to not overwhelm them, but to elevate them to being in the stars of, of the photograph. It's a bit of, bit of a change of pace here, from the ethereal to an almost boring normality. But it was one that was at odds with the, the, with the grim reality of apartheid-era South Africa. David Goldblatt photographed the changing face of South Africa from the, from the 1960s onwards. Perhaps he is best known for two books, which, at least for me, sort of perfectly sum up this, this sort of weird duality of that time. Those books are some Afrikaners photographed, and a book called In Boxburg. 
Now in Boxburg is an excellent example of how personal circumstance and experience so greatly shapes the way that we interpret photography as a, as a viewer, especially documentary photography. To illustrate this, in 1984, my family moved from the UK to South Africa into to a suburb not far from Boxburg. Now, like a lot of places at the time, these suburbs looked fairly similar. You know, all the houses were built by the same company. Everybody seemed to have these sort of scrubby, newly laid lawns. And South Africa's in the middle of a drought then, so everything was very dry and dusty. And there were these wide open stretches of felt between the suburbs. And, and there, dotted around when you went for a drive with, with the mines and the mine dumps of, of Johannesburg. So when I page through the book and I look at these photographs in, in, in Boxburg, I don't necessarily see the narrative that Goldblatt is, is creating. Certainly from my you know, photographic standpoint, I can see, the, see what he's driving at and, and this kind of this, this juxtaposition of, of the images and, and, and the powerful message that they have. But because of my own personal perspective of these images, they don't evoke within me the same sort of emotional disquiet that I would get from, say, looking at, at pictures of, of 1930s Germany. And this, is, this is a tricky thing. It makes me feel somewhat uncomfortable that rather than looking at these photographs and thinking of, of, the, of the inhumanity that man is capable towards other men, they don't, they don't do that. They remind me of, of my childhood. You know, that, 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 that these are places that feel familiar to me, that they, they evoke nostalgia. And, 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 and in fact, I feel uncomfortable even admitting that. And, and in some ways, I, I don't know if I'm going to get any flack for that, but it, it's, I don't see that. And it's, it's just such a powerful illustration of, of how much that when we read photographs or, or even take photographs, that the way that other people would interpret them is going to be so personal, so unique. Now, perhaps it's because of the way that Goldblatt photographed without any sort of overt message in mind that allows me to, to kind of possibly interpret these, these images in, in some way. You know, it goes to show that, that one doesn't always really need to be in your face, you know, to ram home a point in photography to create images that have an emotional impact. As an aside, there is fairly obviously a rich history of, of photography in, in South Africa, especially documentary photography, both from a black and a white photographer's perspective. Now, originally I wanted to talk about Alf Kamalo. Now he was Nelson Mandela's personal photographer. He was at Sharpville and he, and he saw a side of apartheid which, which the West and, and white photographers most certainly did not. Unfortunately, there is it is so little of his work that is available online, and, and I very much doubt that it ever will be. Because after his death, his estate has been the subject of, of legal wranglings and, and, and all this kind of stuff that somewhat times goes on. And all of this is going on, his negative archive, his, all his collection of negatives are in a museum that he, he started about his photography, which is now just slowly rotting away in, in a field somewhere near Soweto, I believe. And I think that's a, that's a crying shame that for every one Vivian Meyer, there are so many other important photographers who are becoming lost to history. And of course, that is possibly one of the, one of the drawbacks of, of the analog versus the digital age. In a sort of counterpoint to Joyce Tennyson, Steve Double has a more experimental, certainly less focused and a, and a more diverse sort of feel to his photography. Like, well, pretty much everybody when they are young, you know, I was quite heavily into music and the, and the pages of the NME, which is a, 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 a musical newspaper here in the UK, helped to shape my, my early visual tastes along with, with my music tastes. And at the time, Steve Double was my photographic hero. It was the early 90s, you know, Britpop was all the rage along with grunge and his photographs helped open doors for my own photography. They said that I could break rules, that I could try different things and, well, basically just do my own thing because nobody had ever done this before. Now, that's hardly a groundbreaking worldview, but it's one that every teenager thinks is, is completely unique to their generation and it certainly was for me. At the time, I thought his cropping, the use of gel lightings, the emulsion lifts and being able to capture these larger than life celebrities in, in a unique way that was so at odds with what I'd been told about photography up until that point, you know, was, was, was revolutionary. 
but little did I know that I was getting small introductions piece by piece to the likes of Richard Avedon and the likes of, of David Bailey. It's fairly hackneyed now and it probably probably was then. But you know, I was, I was throwing in some cross-processing into my work. I was doing all sorts of things and these photographs piece by piece were helping me to fill in a few paragraphs, a few words into my visual dictionary. Of course, looking back now, some of those photographs are just like complete bubble gum. But, but of course, that's the point. You know, they were created for disposable newspapers of, of what at the time were disposable music stars. And of course, that's their beauty, that they are fun. You know, unlike the images of, of say, Kevin Cummins, who, who I greatly admire, but his photographs came across as earnest and, and serious. Because all of the things that Steve Double did, I, I could copy. It wasn't difficult, you know, it, it's obviously getting a great photograph is, is tricky, but the, the, the base techniques are not, they weren't that super difficult. And that was one of the joys, obviously, of a pre-digital world, that it, it, it wasn't too hard to kind of sort of pick apart how somebody created something. So I was playing with gels, with cross-processing, you know, all of the, the techniques he was doing, this kind of wobbling the, the easel during a print, which I'm gonna guess is what was, was behind this, this photograph, you know, so one part is out of focus. All this stuff is, is, is about copying, and copying is a great tool that you can employ to develop your own photographic skills. Finding inspiration can be extremely difficult when everybody's drawing from the same pool, you know, that we're looking in the same places. I'd encourage you to look a bit further into times and places that aren't all that well visited, you know, like me talking about the early 90s sort of Britpop scene. Look into your own childhood, look at things slightly outside of photography, you know, maybe you know, your album art covers and stuff like that. Look at what inspires you and you're gonna find a rich, rich, rich seam of inspiration that you can mine for your photography, which neatly goes into the David Goldblatt thing of being on the mines in Joburg. You see what I did there? So, so clever. <laughs> anyway, thank you ever so much for being here once again. I, you know, thanks for watching and uh, have a good weekend and we'll see you again next week.